This is a presentation of the 19th Annual Colorado Snow and Avalanche Workshop, a program of the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, Friends of CAIC, and the National Avalanche Center, presented by Dina Fit and Pomoka. Hello, my name is Carl Berkland, and thank you for watching my presentation for the Colorado Snow and Avalanche Workshop. The title of our presentation is Changes in Propagation Saw Test Critical Cut Length in the Minutes and Hours Following Loading. Now, my co authors for this presentation are Bastian Bergfeld and Alec Van Herenen. I'd like to thank both of them. Bastian and Alec work at the SLF which also provided me with a visiting fellowship. Basti was supported by a grant from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And we'd also like to thank Ben Reuter. He was a co-author on our previous paper and he helped provide some of the motivation for this continuing research. Well, avalanches are typically easier to trigger during the loading. And then the snow typically begins to stabilize following that loading. And that's the focus of this research on investigating snowpack changes in the minutes and hours following loading. Now this research was guided by the following relationship that came out of some of the work that Jörg Schweitzer and colleagues did. Don't get intimidated by the equation. I'll explain it. Um, essentially this this R sub C is simply your propagation saw test or your propagation saw test cut length. The WF here is the resistance to crack propagation. The E here is the slab stiffness or this the uh, elastic modulus. And then under here we have the load. And so what we're looking at here is that your critical cut length actually as that um, increases, as you, or rather as your load increases, that will decrease your critical cut length. As your resistance to crack propagation increases, so will your critical cut length. Or as your slab stiffens, your critical cut length will also increase. Now in this experiment, we kept the load constant and we're looking at the changes in your critical cut length your resistance to propagation and your slab stiffness over time. And the time um, that we're looking at is in the minutes and hours immediately following loading. So we have some previous work that we did on this. Um, we presented it at the ISSW in Innsbruck and also published it in Cold Region Science. And what we saw here, we have time here we have the uh, measured and mod modeled critical cut length, and we see a rapid increase at first, and then a more gradual increase over time. Now, in this work that we're gonna present today, we're actually looking at these shorter time, um, this shorter time length uh, from our previous work. So we went to, um, we did our work near the SLF and we used these beautiful concrete bunkers that the SLF owns. Um, we called this one Carl's Bunker. And the great thing about these bunkers is that they have a nice flat concrete roof. And so we uh, minimize the amount of spatial variability. They also tend to be in the shade, they're near a creek, and we get lots of surface ore formation. Um, this is what our snowpack looked like. And so we had a nice layer of surface horror buried right underneath the surface, um, but we didn't really have a slab. And so for this research, we actually are going to load a slab on top of the snowpack and then test that layer of surface horror. Um, here's just a close up picture of the surface horror sitting on top of the sieve we use for our work. And so that's five millimeters. So you can see these are very well-developed uh, surface ore crystals. Our method involved adding 10 centimeters of sieve snow 
to create a slab on top of the existing snowpack. So we took um, snow, we have this um, very complicated cardboard and duct tape frame. We take a, a, um, a sieve, we shovel snow in there, and then we sieve the snow into that cardboard frame. And then after we do that, we make several of these as we make them, then we completely isolate them and then mark down the time or note the time. Then when we get ready for the test, we isolate it on all sides. Again, it was isolated right after we created the, um, after we added the block, we isolated it completely with a snow saw. But when we're ready to do the test, we shovel out all the snow around it like this. And then uh, Basti sprayed the blocks with ink and we're going to use this for digital image correlation analysis to better analyze the fracture. And then we filmed all of them with a high-speed camera that films at 3,000 frames per second. And I'll just show you an example of one of these. Here's the test. You can see over here is where I'm cutting and the weak layers right here and you'll see it fracture. Cutting and boom, the fracture goes across. Again, this is a 3000 frames per second. We'll do one more and watch this right here. And again, very, very small cut length. So we're talking about a extremely unstable snowpack situation there. After each propagation saw test, we measured the density of the added slab, and then we also collected three snow micropen profiles of the, um, of the snowpack. In addition, in one PST, we did a snow micropen profile every 10 centimeters along the entire column to quantify the variability that might exist in our sieve slabs. With the sieve slabs, we're trying to make something as homogeneous as possible. We realize that's very difficult with snow. And so this transect along um, one of the PSTs was tried to try to see how homogeneous we were able to make these slabs. And so this is what our results look like. Um, we have a, let's see, hang on just a second. We have a, uh, on this axis right here, on the y-axis, we have our critical cut length. And on this axis right here, we have the time after loading in minutes. So we go all the way from four minutes here out to about seven and a half hours. And as you can see, our critical cut lengths increase over time. Remember, our load is constant. Our critical cut length is increasing. So the next question we're asking ourselves is, what are the changes in our slab stiffness and the resistance of our weak layer to fracture that might be driving these increases in critical cut length? So we measured our slab density. Density relates to the stiffness of the weak layer or I mean of the slab, I'm sorry, or the elastic modulus. And what we can see is that our densities really don't increase much. They really don't change much from about, we have one outlier here, the measurement at four minutes, but the rest of them all fall between about 330 cubic, um, 330 kilograms per cubic meter and oh, about 385. Uh, kilograms per cubic meter. So, so not much in the way of temporal change there. If we look at our penetration resistance versus time. So here's the penetration resistance as measured with the snow micro pen. Um, we had three measurements per time sequence or per 
propagation sod test, and then we average those. And we can see as we look at over time that initially we had a fairly rapid increase in our penetration resistance, and then a more gradual increase out here to uh, seven hours. These are the results of our variations in our uh, slab penetration resistance in that one, um, the one test over 120 centimeters. We have 12 different snow micropen profiles. Each one of those is represented by this trace here. These are sort of, these are penetration hardness traces. And this line here is represents the bottom of the slab layer, the added slab layer. And what we see is that there's more variation than we expected. Um, we thought we were making a perfectly consistent slab, but we can see that in some areas it was a little bit thinner, maybe around um, 80, 85 millimeters or eight and a half centimeters. In some areas it was a little thicker, maybe around 110 millimeters or 11 centimeters. So we have a little bit of variation there. And if we look at the, um, a graph of the penetration force versus the distance down the block. So here we have um, at the start of the block and then down to 120 centimeters. And if we look at just, let's, let's just take a look at this uh, orange line here. The orange line is the median uh, penetration resistance. And we can see that it ranges from down here around uh, 0.35. It goes up to about 0.6 and back down. So we have a fairly large uh, variation in our penetration resistance just across one of these um, hopefully uniform blocks. And so this, diff the differences that we're observing here are probably driving some of the scatter that we see in our data. So if we just compare our research to the previous work that we did, again, here we have our measured uh, critical crack lengths and our time. And we're just looking at these first minutes and hours. Um, if we look at the data that we collected previously, we had a fair bit of scatter in those data. And in our research that we're doing right now, um, that we're presenting right now, we actually have um, the data are, are quite a bit cleaner and we attribute that to both using a sieve and then the area that we were working in had <clears throat> probably less spatial variability than our previous work and um, so we we're able to make uh, some improvements there. In conclusion, we see increases in critical crack length due to slab stiffening. We observed some slab stiffening that we measured with the snow micro pen. And there's also possibly some changes going on in the weak layer. It's hard to um, imagine that we're seeing big changes in the weak layer over the short time period with a layer like that surface hoar. Um, but perhaps that adding that load, um, maybe we, um, got that surface hoar by putting that load on, maybe that surface hoar penetrated some of the layers above and below it a little bit that helped increase the strength a little bit, but we weren't able to measure any changes in the weak layer. So the bottom line is that we're observing rapid stabilization. Now this rate surely varies depending on the weak layer, the load, uh, the temperature, the type of slab added, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of variabilities that come into play. In terms of practical applications, we can use this technique that we've developed with just a frame made out of cardboard and duct tape. We can um, disaggregate snow instead of using a sieve. You can disaggregate it with your hands and you can actually load up weak layers that you have in your snowpack, but maybe you don't have a very big load on them, maybe you don't have a slab on them yet, and you can see how they might react um, once they do get loaded, uh, perhaps by some wind-loaded snow or, um, you know, a different snowstorm that comes in on top of them. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you, 
and I appreciate you taking the time to watch my presentation to the Colorado Snow and Avalanche Workshop. And I hope you tune in to the live sessions where myself and my co-authors will be available to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>